Good morning and welcome to Science Club Live. Uh, we are all about coral um, over the next two weeks and welcome one and all. Great um, to have you all with us. Um, we've got an amazing number. Good morning and welcome to Science Club Live. Uh, we are all about and we're coral, just um, going to sort out some weeks audio here. And great to have you all with us. Um, we we have an amazing number of uh, homeschoolers um, tuning in. Uh, so welcome, one and all. We have people from the UK, India. Switzerland, Ukraine, uh, Australia, Guernsey, USA, and Bermuda. And some very, very special shout outs um, to give to you all as well. Um, we have Ravenswood School. So hello to all the students at Ravenswood who are at home now. Hope you're enjoying um, the homeschool holidays. Um, wondering what else you're getting up to. And we've got James, Sam, and Lucy in Newcastle. Good morning, uh, James, Sam, and Lucy. Uh, we have all the year two pupils at St. Teresa's um, Primary School in Chester. Hi, hope you are enjoying the first day of homeschool holidays. And also to Mrs. McConnell's uh, daughters, Isla Smiler and Amelia. Massive good morning to you. Now, this is Science Club Live. We're all about the coral reef, the wonderful coral. So it's almost like a, a holiday um, over the course of, of, the, of the next uh, couple of weeks. And today is all about what is a coral polyp? Is it animal, vegetable or mineral? Or is it a little bit of all three? Now, what we're doing in this uh, live lesson is we're going over the activity and a few other little bits and facts uh, about the coral polyp. And then we'll go over to the live chat just over here and we will see all the questions that are coming through. We've also had some pre-submitted questions. A couple of tips, live chat using YouTube, that is a social media. So uh, young students, young children shouldn't be using that without um, supervision. And definitely we're looking for adults to, to set up their own accounts to get onto that. Um, so please do, if you can, make sure that you are using I'm pointing to the wrong side. The live chat's in fact this side, isn't it? Um, the pointing um, that. Um, so do please tune in and make sure when you're with an adult account um, on YouTube, and if you are sending messages here, please make sure that they are appropriate. This is still a live science club. So appropriate questions and comments there would be absolutely fantastic. Now, how did you all get on? with your incredible edible polyp. How many of you had it for breakfast? Let's have a quick look. Um, Tom and Lottie back, great to have you. And Oscar uh, and Lily Rose and Martha from Brisbane. Um, this is this is my one. How do you get on with your one? Should we just go over this together and just see how you got, get over? And, and massive um, good morning to all the Banan family. Um, so we have a coral polyp inside here is my piece of banana and that's the coral polyp body so if you remember it's related to a jellyfish so tentacles going through the water like this and it's also related to an anemone which you might know from finding Nemo which is a basically a jellyfish stuck to the bottom of the sea still with tentacles and then we have the coral related to both of those but slightly smaller normally when it's making up this kind of amazing structure. And it has a mouth in the middle. So it's feeding, taking the tentacles, feeding from, from, from the, the water, little copepods and the whole plankton. It has uh, this amazing structure. So it's taking chalky stuff from the water, a mineral from the water and making a structure. And then it has these cool little, I've got hundreds and thousands. Um, they're not very green, we couldn't find green. No lockdown, hundreds and thousands for us. Um, but we have little hundreds and thousands. And those are what are called the Susanthelli. Now Susanthelli, they're a type of algae, algae-like creature, plant-like 
organism and that lives inside the coral. We're going to do more about coral feeding tomorrow, um, but this is basically we're looking at the anatomy today. Now I've got my polyp sat in this biscuit cup, but in fact it's not quite like that. Um, in fact the tissue goes all over of the structure. So in terms of whether coral is animal, vegetable, I mean, I was checking in on, on, on the live chat as well. Um, in terms of the structure and the tissue, it actually comes all over the body. Now I've got a coral skeleton here. And what we can see, can you see all those tiny holes? Another one, you can hold them both up. So those tiny holes, that is where this, your coral polyp would live. Okay, and the, but the tissue covers all over the surface. I think the really cool thing for me is that all the coral polyps are joined together. So they live like a colony and they share their nutrients. So they're really lovely in sharing and sharing all their food around, whatever they get. I think it's maybe that's something that we can learn in this day and age, um, that sharing is caring, be, be, be more coral. And you can see underneath, here we go, some of the channels. I don't know whether that's going to be very clear on the video, but some of the channels um, created for the ability to share all the nutrients. This is a star coral um, from the Caribbean. So very, very lovely. Um, I do have some close-up pictures of coral polyps, which I'm just going to share with you. I'm not going to eat my, my own incredible edible polyp quite yet. I might do that at the end because it can make an awful mess. But we're just going to have a look at some different coral polyps. And we had a few questions as well. Um, so I'm just going to answer some of those. because I think there's going to be some relevant stuff um, with some of the pictures that we're looking at. Um, first of all, um, and I'm trying to try and get to the next slide. Here we go. Um, I'm going to go through these sort of one by one, not necessarily in the order they've come come through. Uh, um, Martha is using banana, using pineapple because she doesn't like bananas. That's a strong choice. Um, we don't have any pineapple at the moment. And in fact, my kids ate all the banana for breakfast. So I had to go and get some new ones. But there's a really, really great question uh, from Lockdown Meltdown. And Lockdown Meltdown has been on to the underwater imagery that is on the website where you can travel around underwater and would like to know how did they get, how do we get all that footage onto Google Maps? Now, you can see in this picture, there's a diver with a camera. And what they're doing is that they're going along the reef and, and on the back of the camera bit. So the cameras, they're sort of like that sort of fisheye bit at the front. And then they've got a little motor at the back. Now that fisheye bit, there's three of them round to give you a sort of 360 degree view. And they are uh, digital cameras with a wide angle lens. And there's a computer at the back, which you can see that raised bit off, off this sort of sort of system, camera system. And what they're doing is that that's taking a photograph every meter or so along the reef. So you have to drive at a certain speed. And then all those are stored and then can be joined together to create these 360 degree images. Now this was a, a huge international project um, run with a variety of partners. So University of Queensland was one of them for the science side. Underwater Earth was another who were on the sort of technology side. It was supported and funded by XL Catlin, now AXA, uh, an insurance company. And then a partner was Google. Now Google, of course, have had Street View for a long time. But we all felt that if we could get some of the sea onto Street View, have sea view, then it would allow more people to understand what this amazing environment was like. So that's Lockdown Meltdown. I hope that has um, helped you understand a little bit about how 
that imagery got onto Google Maps. And we have some more videos and some more information about the XL Catlin Seaview Survey, which is on the Encounter EDU website. Um, coming up next, just checking in. Uh, so, I mean, for, for me, and, and if 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 you if you're hungry, you can try and start to create um, a coral reef with all your polyps. But for me, it is amazing that a you know animal, which the coral polyp is, tiny wee, growing to can be quite big, like a like a mushroom coral, but can make this beautiful beautiful underwater landscape. And this is is really close up, so you can see right in the middle there, the coral polyp. Um, and this is under a microscope. Now we had a question in uh, from Ravenswood, which was asking about fluorescence in coral. Now fluorescence is when uh, is, is essentially reflecting light back a certain part of the um, light spectrum. So an ultraviolet light, parents who may have um, experienced UV light and fluorescent clothing in a variety of social contexts may be able to give examples of this um, at home. But for corals, if you go night diving with a UV torch, you can see this amazing range of, of bright colors coming back. And it's not a thing that we understand in great depth, there's amazing research going on at the University of Southampton and their coral labs there. But basically it's, it, it's a protein, it's a type of um, bi biology building block inside the coral tissue. And it plays uh, two different roles. Now, coming back to our coral animal, I'll just hold this up so you can see in the sort of, in the sort of tiny screen there. Now, if it's shallow, it might get sunburnt because it lives in the tropics. So it might get sunburnt with all the sun coming up on it. So the idea is that it has these little sunblock proteins, biology building blocks, to protect it from having too much sun on it. Now, if it's getting a bit deeper, it wants more light to create energy. And so sometimes those um, proteins, those building blocks play a different role. They reflect light back up to help it get more energy. And a great question from Ravenswood. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to take some, there's some more questions from Ravenswood, but I'm just going to take some um, from um, the live chat as well. So we have um, from Jill um, has put a, a question in from Alex. Um, does it filter feed? Um, Alex, that's a really great question. I've got this close up um, picture of a um, coral polyp for you. Now, um, the, it feeds in two ways. We're going to go this a little bit more detail um, tomorrow, but it's not a filter feeder. You can see two ways that it gets its energy. One is from, it has a basically a vegetable garden inside its tissue and you kind of see a little bit of that there. It also has harpoon like stinging cells. Um, and those it uses to catch um, prey that goes through the water. And it's a game that we're going to look at tomorrow, the coral feeding game, that will give you a bit more of an idea about that. Um, <laughs> Lily, uh, Lily Rose, uh, what are corals made of? It's a really, really great question. So, Lily, on Lily Rose, on, on this picture, you might be able to see sort of little tentacle type type shapes coming through um, in these little sort of like cups. So it's an animal, so the coral polyp, just to, to, to get that clear, it's an animal. And um, so it's made up of, of um, the building blocks of, of all living things, so the, um, the sort of living tissue. Uh, but underneath that, that shape isn't all muscle. It's not all um, an animal. It's got a mineral, and I'm holding this up on the mini camera. Um, it's got a mineral structure underneath, a bit like a skeleton. And that is made from calcium carbonate. 
and that's the same mineral um, as chalk and it takes those minerals which is dissolved in the ocean and makes this structure underneath and then we'll come to the vegetable part um, tomorrow when we look at the coral feeding game but great great question um, and in terms of I've got this question through um, from it's um, I it's Jabba, and, and the question is, where are, are coral polyps found usually? Now, we associate um, coral with these shallow tropical waters. So we might find them in, in a variety of places where the, the sea temperature is in the sort of mid to high 20 degrees uh, Celsius, so 23 to 28 degrees Celsius, where the water is really clear. So not really near any river mouths or, or where it might be um, a bit cloudy. They're quite like quite shallow water. So between about sort of one meter and about 20, 25, maybe 30 meters deep is what they really, really like. And they don't like it. They like a sort of mid range of salinity, not too salty. Um, and that's where they're found. So in the tropical areas, we've got the Caribbean um, is, is a major area. We've got the Coral Triangle, and that's to the north of Australia. Um, there's a triangle up towards Southeast Asia in between Malaysia and Indonesia and the Philippines. Lots of coral around there. Indian Ocean corals, so the Maldives, um, Seychelles, places like that. And then also across the Pacific Ocean, a lot of um, small islands and coral around there. So those are the, the, the major areas. Red Sea, sorry to, 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 to miss that one out, Red Sea. Um, as well, but we'll get a we'll get a map up, probably linked um, from the from the live chat. We'll get a map um, coming up on there. Um, so here we come on. So just just to give you an idea, so your tiny coral polyp then makes up. On the previous slide, we saw um, the the coral colony makes up these amazing shapes, and then those all start to gather together to make what's called the coral reef. You can see this, you can see the dark patches on the sand being the coral. And then all those can gather together, which is what, this is why I think the coral polyp is such a cool animal, to make a reef mosaic. So we've got this scale from the coral polyp to the coral colony, to a sort of reef patch, all the way up to a coral reef. And this is a, is a reef mosaic. And that means it's lots of different bits of reef making up a long chain. This is the Great Barrier Reef off the eastern coast of Australia, which stretches thousands of kilometers. And I think is one of the only living structures you can see, um, or animal <laughs> structures that you can see uh, from space with the naked eye. I know we can see lots now with, with, with very clever cameras, but with the naked eye, you can see this from space. And We'll come on to this in a bit, la bit later, but I'm just going to stop the sharing of the presentation and come on to um, some of these questions. Um, Sarah, what is the lifespan of a coral? I mean, corals can be some of the, the oldest living creatures on the planet. I think we've got corals, um, deep sea corals, um, thousands of years old. Um, and one of the ways in which we can measure the age of a coral is, is the rings um, that it, where, where the, the, the calcium carbonate is added over years. So you can, you, can, you can tell, like tree rings, you can tell the age of a coral that way. But I think some of the oldest living creatures on the planet, sort of 4,000 plus years old, um, are deep water corals. Um, where are we? Um, we have a question coming in from um, Brisbane, which is, can coral move? Now, um, it's a really great question. So most corals that we're talking about around here, these type of corals, are what are called sessile animals. And sessile is a, is a science word that come, basically means seated. And it's basically like you sit down where you sort of start off life and you're glued to that seat for the rest of your life. You can't move. So you've got a coral polyp when it, when it chooses its home, has to choose its home for a long, long time, for as, for, for as long as it lives. 
Now, there is one kind of coral uh, that can move around a bit, uh, and that is the mushroom coral. Um, so <laughs> with most biology, we find that we have this rule and said, no, no coral can move at all. And there's always a little exception to that rule. Uh, and for, for corals and moving, that's the mushroom coral. Um, coming to, um, I've got a question um, from Ilakia uh, Dharma. Why is it a bit yellow? You're going to have to help me with, with what that was referring to. Um, SDG Warriors, um, great to have you on board today from India. Um, like zoos and conservation parks for animals, do we have anything for corals? Yes, we have um, what are called marine protected areas, and we also have coral conservation projects and restoration projects. So marine protected areas are like a conservation park uh, for um, coral and for the sea. And in the in Australia, for instance, you have the Great Barrier Reef Marine Protected Area, Gabrumpa, um, as the ac acronym is. And basically what that stops, it stops a whole load of activities there that can decrease coral health. Um, fish and sharks are very important for a healthy reef. So fishing is banned often in these types of places. You can't take big ships through there. You can't remove the corals. So you can create sort of like a, like a motorway for big ships and that, and that kind of thing. The second thing that you can do in terms of coral conservation is you can restore the reef. So you can go and plant out a bit like um, reforestation, but with animals. You can go and plant out corals around to help them um, and give them a start, start in life in, in a laboratory setting and then plant them out. And that's uh, some of the research that we follow when we go and do coral live. And that's our annual coral science outreach program. And that's from Kamabi, amazing uh, research station on the Caribbean island of Curaçao. Um, so uh, I think we have some old videos from that, some live lessons looking at coral restoration. We'll get those up or do join us live from Curaçao in November. Um, is there, um, this is from Tom and Lottie. Um, is there more than one type of coral polyp? There are, I think, about, and I remember this, I'm going to get this, um, I can't remember exactly, because I know the 70 species of, of hard coral in the Caribbean. I'm just trying to remember um, how many species of hard coral there are globally, and it's either 400 or 700. That has slipped my mind at the moment. What we're also thinking is, and this is a question through from Ravenswood as well, asking about the difference between hard corals and soft corals and the type of polyps they have. So soft corals are amazing. If you if you have a look um, online for a picture of a sea fan, and they are soft corals, same, same, same sort of broader family, and they um, are beautiful. They don't have this really hard bony structure. They have a little bit of calcium carbonate just to give them some shape. But the deeper you go, also you get all these different shapes, um, more sort of, how would you put it, more sort of like tree-like, plant-like shapes of coral, soft corals, um, which they don't have this really hard um, structure. Um, and just to cover another question from Ravens with great range of questions um, that they put in, is that they were asking about um, how does a coral polyp <laughs> reproduce the three Bs of uh, coral <laughs> reproduction. Um, so there's broadcast, there's brooding, and there's budding. Um, so we'll do the, the, the first ones. How, how do coral babies happen? Uh, the first thing is that um, you have the, the, the sperm and the eggs, and sometimes they get broadcast into the water in a, in, a, in a mass spawning event, and then they fertilize and create coral larvae. So um, if you think of an animal, I kind of look at a UK, big UK audience, but um, looking at frogs, so the tadpole stage, the larval stage, and then that will settle and, and start to grow in, into a um, into a sort of young polyp. Brooding is where um, the fertilization happens within the coral polyp, and then those are released as larvae in, into the into the waters and go and find somewhere to settle. 
Now, if we're talking uh, scientifically, that's called sexual reproduction, where you have fertilization and that grows into uh, a new animal. But the coral polyp is, is, is pretty cool because it also does something called asexual reproduction, which is where you have um, a single polyp. Bring my biscuit back here, a single polyp. And then when it gets to a certain size, it buds into two and they each grow a bit of structure and then those are each button to two and two and two. Um, so you have this asexual reproduction, which is really where um, one animal splits into two. So basically a clone of itself cloning and splits and splits and splits and splits. And that's how the single coral polyp um, can make something really, really cool. I'm just gonna lean back. Um, this is one of my favorite here. Um, makes a really, really cool shape like that and here. Um, so, um, <laughs> lots of questions coming coming through. I'm going to try and ask. We've got four minutes left, very sadly. Um, um, when uh, this is from Yeet, when corals die, what happens? Um, well, you you a lot of the reef is is based on dead and dying corals, so they grow on top of all structures of coral um, like this. Um, so uh, that's so <laughs> this 3D sort of seascape is really, really cool and useful. Um, so the old coral skeletons and then new corals will, will grow on top of that. Uh, uh, what does coral eat? That's tomorrow's life lesson. We're going to come on to that. Um, you, the thing about coral bleaching, really, really um, important thing to know about. Mass bleaching event happening on the Great Barrier Reef at the moment. And we're going to come to that. I think that next week, the coral threats live this and we're going to go over all the impacts that carbon emissions are having on the coral reef um, around the world. Um, so we're going to come on to that. Uh, Lucas, the oldest living coral today, over 4,000 years old, so we can find that. Um, uh, where are we? Um, so this is from Jess. How is a coral, coral polyp, important in geography? So if geography is um, something you're interested in, um, that's very, very cool. Um, I have um, a daughter coming through here um, who would like to be part of this live lesson. I think we're all home homeschooling at the moment. This is Katya. Um, so um, coral um, important <laughs> in geography. So um, the reason why it's important is that it provides huge amount of money, livelihood, um, tourism, fishing for I think about a billion people around the world. It's worth something like a multiples of trillion dollars to the global economy, both in terms of um, sort of fish and in terms of tourism and in terms of coastal protection. Um, so in for geography, it's a it's a very, very important habitat because it covers sort of about 0.1 percent of the world's surface. But is in terms of what it does, so if you have a city next to the coast, it can protect that city from coral. I mean, not from coral, from, from storms. Um, it can provide food, it can provide tourism. It, it supports 25% of all marine life. Amazingly, amazingly important habitat and ecosystem. Um, some more questions coming through. Um, if we cut off a bit of coral and immediately put it back into another pool, would it start growing? Yes, you can get, are you going to go or are you going to stay for this? You stay for, for two more minutes. Um, no, uh, if, you, if you cut it off, you can um, plant it off um, on other parts of the reef. Um, so that, that, is, that is possible. Um, and we've got time for one more question. Um, and that is going to be, I'm just going to uh, find out here. Um, this is going to be from Ella, age seven. Um, Ella, um, great, great question. Uh, does anything eat coral polyps? Now, one of the deadliest uh, coralivores, and that's what we call a specialist coral eater, is the crown of thorn starfish. Um, so have a look at the picture of those online. They come on, onto the coral polyp. They eject, the, basically eject their sort of stomach juices onto the coral and dissolves all that mush and then sucks that back up. Um, into itself. So that is the crown of thorn starfish. If you're diving on the reef, you might hear the scrape, 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 and that might be a parrot fish munching the coral. 
and there are a few few other invertebrates, some uh, nudibranchs or sea slugs, and that also eat coral polyps. Um, so great question. Thank you so much uh, for all the questions. So as we go through Science Club um, live for spring with Encounter EDU, we're going to go through each of these activities one by one. And then these live sessions are for the Q&A, just to go over anything from that activity that you didn't quite understand. If you can support us to do more Science Club activities, I know that the team have put um, a coffee.com link and so if you'd like to, to, to support us with a, with a cup of coffee, as it were, um, the links on the live chat, that would be super, super kind. I'm looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow uh, for the Coral Feeding Game Review. Uh, I think it's great fun, great um, to play as well, to see how many you can catch. Um, but to know more about that, you'll have to look at the activity online. So thank you all so much for joining. But for now, bye bye.